today what we would be doing is, uh, we would try to understand that how this whole concept of uh, normality has evolved, what is so special about it, uh, know that it is uh, given extra weightage uh, both in the legal framework, in the social framework, even in the clinical framework. Okay. And we will take a couple of examples to see that uh, is it that uh, aberrations uh, are acceptable, is it that aberrations are not acceptable and how this whole uh, interplay of uh, normality, subnormality and abnormality begins. Initially, we will be focusing only on normality and with respect to, nor once we establish normality, with respect to it, then we will try to understand the whole issue of abnormality and once normal and abnormal ends are known to us, then we will try to find out uh, is there a possibility of defining something like subnormality. Till now what we have been doing, the first lecture we talked about the biomedical model, uh, where the focus was uh, more on the scientific temper of uh, the medical fraternity, the whole issue of classification of diseases. Okay. And then we took the whole issue that find uh, the way classification of diseases are taken into account and the way biomedical model is used to define uh, constructs there. That has been extended also to uh, behavioral sciences where so for even for behavioral elaborations for uh, psychological disorders, similar type of models are looked at. Then we did uh, try to see that uh, the social context is uh, equally important and the moment you uh, delink classification from the social context, it creates a trouble, it creates a problem. And we saw uh, no statements of a uh, couple of uh, psychologists, what type of uh, problems uh, they experience, they explain in terms of extending biomedical model to behavioral sciences. Now, when we look at the whole issue of adjustment, it is equally important to understand uh, adjustment as a social construction. Social construction means the society at large decides what is normal and what is not. Okay. Now, remember uh, in the beginning I told you that uh, there at times there could be matches, the at times there could be mismatches between the social construction of uh, a disease or a disorder or an aberration okay, and the way it is clinically looked upon. Okay. Today what we are uh, saying is that before we define uh, what is normality from a clinical perspective, okay, let us first look at the social construction of normality. Okay. Now, one of the connotations of adjustment is normal, means how normal you are. Means, those who are uh, technically aware of the know-hows in the discipline will tell you whether you are adjusted or you have an uh, adjustment issue, whether you are mal adjusted. But the social connotation of this adjustment is whether you are normal or not. And there could be you know a uh, uh, very, very explicit way of saying that uh, you are not normal or you have some problem. There could be uh, no very uh, no tacit way of making you realize that this pattern of behavior does not have the approval. Uh, for example, if you uh, take into account something like uh, uh, people in your com uh, neighborhood, people in your community, uh, using certain uh, signage to represent that this behavior is aberrated or you are not adjusted or you are not normal. Say, uh, for example, you know, somebody does something or somebody explains things in a particular way and you say, okay, the moment you put your finger here and you say something like this, the moment you indicate like this, this is a non-verbal indicator uh, that this is not working properly, means your normality is at a stake. Okay. Or when we use uh, loosely certain words, no, uh, in this uh, region of the country, people would very generously use khisak gaya hai, okay, dhila hai. Okay. So, the moment you are told khisak gaya hai, even uh, right now we will also discuss it, that actually khisak gaya is that you have been displaced. Okay, you are dislocated. Now, dislocated with respect to what? Okay. 
and then we would discuss that fine there is something like a social construction of normality and then khisagya is deviation. So, this is a social perception of something which is otherwise statistically proved to be deviation. Okay. So, how much you deviate, what constructs normality, how abnormality is defined and then you find that uh, you know if you ask people who use words like this, okay, how do you define khisagya or how do you define this or how do you define uh, say dhila hai, what it means not to be khiska hua, not to be dhila, not to be uh, this, what exactly that means. You will find people will have difficulty explaining it, okay, because these are uh, loosely defined. Okay. So, what we tried, uh, what we are trying to do here is that the way we are trying to define adjustment, the way we are trying to understand adjustment, adjustment one of the connotation is that how normal you are and therefore, with respect to uh, the psychology of adjustment, we need to understand what normality means. Okay. And here adjustment and normality primarily we are looking at it as a social construction, then we would try to fit it into a behavioral and legal framework also. Uh, it is essential for us to be aware of those classificatory measures that are commonly used by people to construe normality. So, there would be a classificatory scheme means what is normality or who is normal. Okay. And when I say who is normal, then I should have a scheme okay, that if you have 1, 1 a, 1 b, 1 c, if you have 2, okay, 2 a, 2 b, 2 c, if you have 3, 3 a, 3 b, 3 c a minimum one of uh, each of these categories, then you can be thought to be normal. So, some type of a classificatory schemes, which otherwise loosely is used to measure you. Okay. So, the way you manifest your behavior, okay, the manifested behavior will be evaluated with respect to the classificatory scheme, which has social approval and that will uh, finally, help people at large define who is normal and who is not. Now, there could be uh, different ways of defining normality, if we are looking at it from a scientific viewpoint, okay, the way uh, psychologists will look at it. One way of defining normality is that it is a statistical norm. Okay. In fact, if you break this word norm, okay, from there you have normality or normal. Okay. So, your uh, compliance to the norm makes you normal, if you have uh, no difficulty complying to the norm, find your normality is at stake. So, one way of defining normality could be that you just look at it as a statistical average. In terms of a statistical average, many of you must be aware of this normal probability curve. Okay. Now, this curve uh, know, uh, is based on certain assumptions. Know. Uh, that one of the basic assumption of this curve is that the mean, median and the mode lies on the same plane, which actually does not happen. Okay. Uh, just to recapitulate, you all are of course, aware of it. No? Mean would mean that it is the average of the numbers. Okay. Median would mean that it is a half way uh, above and below which 50 percent of the case it would, cases would lie. Okay. And mode would be the uh, average of the frequency of occurrence of something. Okay. So, usually if you compute uh, mean, median and mode, you would realize that they are numerically they are not the same. Okay. But one of the assumption of this uh, normal probability curve is that the mean, median and the mode they would lie on the same plane. Assuming that, okay, it says that there is a range. You know, if you look at the population at large, okay, uh, you will have 68.2 percent of the cases, which usually you know, lie between the minus 1 and plus 1 sigma no? and they are considered to constitute the majority group. Okay. So, from a, a social construction point of view, when you say that this is the view of the majority, this is how the society is, this is what usually you see in the society, it actually means that is only 68.2 percent of the people, their behavioral manifestations are taken into account, if normality is looked upon from a statistical viewpoint. Okay. Uh, two, uh, you have uh, 13.6 percent cases on both the ends, no? minus 2 uh, 
and minus 1 sigma and plus 2 and plus 1 sigma that is the group no, uh, which does not fit into this majority group, okay. but this is another subsection on both the ends. Okay. So, if you take the plus side uh, no, to be more of uh, uh, normal, normal behavior or more of normality, the negative end would be more of a problem with complying to the norm. And so, finally, we also have uh, no 2.15 percent on both the ends, which would be uh, extreme. Okay. So, extreme in terms of complying to norm and extreme in terms of not at all complying to the norm. Okay. But the best part of this normal probability curve also is that uh, the curve does not touch the baseline. Okay. So, you have a very, very small percentage, uh, which actually cannot be fitted into this normal probability curve. We are not going into the statistics, but just to tell you that uh, in majority of the cases, when in psychology we people take data, they try to see how uh, good this data fits into the normal probability curves. In majority of the cases, you find that you cannot achieve normal probability curve. Okay. So, either the curve gets skewed, means either it moves more towards the positive end or more towards the negative end. So, there is a skewness in the curve, it is not exactly the bell shaped curve or one possibility is that uh, no, you can have kurtosis means majority falls between uh, no, uh, plus minus 1 sigma. No. So, what you find is that suddenly the peak at the center goes very uh, high okay, and then there is a sharp decline and uh, you will find very, very little percentage uh, between uh, no, um, plus 2 sigma and plus 3 sigma and minus 2 and minus 3 sigma. That would be the extreme of compliance. Okay. But statistically, if you have to compute the norm, uh, the best idea is that you uh, know have a good representation of uh, the population in the sample, one have a very, very large sample size, two and then uh, you know, try to see if the sample that you have chosen. Uh, no, to define a construct, whether it fits uh, into the normal probability curve or not. This could be one way of defining normality, when you are trying to have uh, no elements in your classificatory scheme, that these are for example, 12 uh, ideal characteristics that I would be looking at, if I have to define normality. Okay. The other way of uh, looking at normality is that you just uh, know, uh, define it as an ideal standard. You do not look into how many people fit into it, how much of uh, know, it get represented by majority okay. or is it uh, know that uh, when you set the ideal, it is only you know, the people uh, know, between uh, plus 2 and plus 3 sigma who will uh, know, fit into that. You are not at all interested in stuffs like that. All you say that this is the ideal standard. In terms of grading, I would say that it is absolute grading, no? there is nothing like relative grading. Okay. Unlike the system that we follow here at IIT, that you have a relative grading system. No? So, you are compared against uh, say the remaining 58 students who are registered in this course okay. and accordingly the norms for grading is defined. In this case, it would be something like an absolute grading system, where you just fix the benchmark, this is the benchmark. If you fall short of it, you are not normal and that is the ideal standard. It can again be an issue that is it that uh, no, once you have an ideal standard for defining normality, is it that it is rigidly followed or if you fall short of the standard, okay, that also is acceptable, that issue we will take little later. And then one other possibility is that you simply try to define normality as behavior which is not abnormal, behavior that is not subnormal. So, I have the full uh, spectrum here and I say this is the extreme ideal standard okay, which is normal, this is completely absurd end which is abnormal, okay. in between I draw the line and I say this is subnormal. So, if you are not abnormal, if you are not subnormal, then I have I do not have any other option but to put you as normal. Okay, this could be also another way of defining normality. Uh, it is not good to say so, uh, but if you uh, comply to the biomedical model in terms of defining 
psychological disorders or behavioral aberrations and you stick very hard to it. One possibility could be that the moment I am asked to make a psychological profile of you, the moment I am asked to you know uh, come upon uh, with an evaluation scheme for you, I might begin only uh, with looking at possible disorders in you. So, instead of asking for your strengths or instead of evaluating your characteristics, I start searching for possibility of a disorder or an aberration. Okay. To say no, this is not there, to say that the second disorder is also not there, third disorder is also not there and because you do not have disorders, therefore you are normal. Okay. This might sound absurd, but this could also be one way of doing it. Okay. The third view point, that you are not abnormal you are not subnormal and therefore, you are normal. But this is say, say something like uh, reducing uh, your potentials as a human being, no? because it starts looking at you as a person who cannot be normal, a person who will certainly devi deviate, a person who cannot follow uh, idealistic uh, standards, a person who definitely would have one or the other disorder which is not uh, true for large majority of us. So, normality you know can be understood from all these viewpoints. An interesting thing because we are trying to look at it initially from uh, the viewpoint of social construction of normality. So, one uh, interesting and very dominant thing uh, is there and you can add to it if you do not uh, accept this viewpoint is that actually the view of the powerful majority has prevailed in terms of defining what is normality. Okay. A large uh, section of the society, uh, which uh, you know, was not socially powerful, okay, their viewpoint was not taken into account. Just now, we will take an example. Okay. That how uh, certain practices in the society was simply not taken into account while defining uh, something which would otherwise be considered to be a normal pattern of behavior. Okay. So, this is uh, one uh, strong thing. Now, I am uh, no, moving away from psychology. Even if you look at uh, the society at large, contemporary society okay, and try to look at it from uh, no, uh, sociological viewpoint, you would realize know that for doing many a things, it is the powerful people, handful people. Okay, their viewpoint has been taken into account. Okay, uh, just for example, if you have to decide uh, something like uh, what should be the cutoff score okay, for including somebody uh, in IIT system, or if I have to decide a parameter of uh, who should be uh, given PSY 451 in HSS lottery. Okay. All you have to do is to just give your choice, your preference and there is a small mass which decides to overrule your preference. Okay. Many of you must have experienced it, no? you uh, opted for something else and finally, got something else. Okay. And uh, given the size of uh, the uh, no, students crediting a course, it is extremely difficult now. Most of the instructors will tell you that sorry, no, your add drop request cannot be entertained. Okay. You, and then you realize fine, the course was made for me, not for the instructor. Okay. You asked me uh, my preference and then you decided to overrule it. Then what is the point in asking me my preference? Okay, this could be one way of looking at it. No? So, you realize it fine, it is a, a powerful uh, majorities whose viewpoint exists, no, because you are the instructor, therefore, you enjoy the liberty of saying uh, that I can add to, I, I can add you to my course or I will not add you or I may even refuse your uh, request to drop a course. Is that not so? Even for drops, Okay, you need permission of the concerned instructor. No, you make a drop request, and the instructor is free to accept or reject your drop request. 
okay. whether you add or drop a course, the course will certainly run throughout the semester. This means that although you are one of the stakeholder in this whole process of te undergraduate teaching, okay, you are at the mercy of the instructors. Okay. Similarly, you have other other uh, know, um, uh, processes in the society, where you realize that a small group of people, they decide you know, what you should do and what you should not. Okay. Where there could be a viewpoint, which is uh, you know, echoed from many corners, many people talking about it, but then that viewpoint is simply overruled. Okay. Uh, the recent uh, episode uh, of uh, a gang rape in Delhi and you have this whole uh, no, uh, social process going on, where people will go for uh, uh, no, uh, strike, people going uh, in uh, uh, mass protesting against uh, the actions of certain stakeholders in the uh, process, uh, this whole uh, process of governance. Okay. This whole thing, it, till date it is continuing. Okay. This means that you realize that there is a viewpoint of a powerful majority, which is dominating and my viewpoint is not being heard. Because as an individual, I cannot, my, uh, cannot make my uh, presence felt. Therefore, hundreds and thousands of people will collect. Because I know that if you allow me to sit as a designated place in the national capital, my voice can still be unheard. So, I go to the place which is nearest to the decision making center in Delhi. Okay. This whole issue of taking the you know, uh, procession to India gate, going beyond that, going to the junction point between the north and the south blocks in Delhi, okay. going straight up to the gate of uh, the president's house. All this shows that you want that my dear powerful majority listen to me. Okay. And I is not singular I here, I not as an individual, but we okay, as a collective uh, group are sharing our concern and we want the system of governance to be modified. Take another controversial issue in our uh, country, uh, the whole issue of uh, whether uh, there should be a reservation on the basis of uh, caste structure or not. A group of people who will uh, endorse it, a group of people who will go against it, a group of people who would talk with respect to uh, no, uh, degradation in the, the uh, saturation level of competence, uh, achievement and many, many more uh, of such constructs. And people who would be uh, sharing their sufferings, because they were you know, accidentally born in a particular family, which belonged to a particular caste and therefore, they were deprived of certain opportunities. Okay. And then you say that you did not hear me, you did not hear my viewpoint. Okay. You just uh, know you were the powerful majorities, you decided the norm, who should be uh, benefited, who should not be and uh, I have been suffering from couple of generations. Okay. You will hear many such stories, okay. people uh, sharing their uh, suffering, okay. uh, how they suffered when they were uh, a student, how they suffered when they landed up in a profession and many such things. Okay. Even something uh, much more uh, sacrosanct like uh, worshipping a god, uh, worshipping a particular deity, uh, visiting a particular temple, offering prayers in a particular way. Okay. You find that there are uh, no classificatory scheme that the society has laid down, in terms of what is prescribed and what is proscribed. Prescribed means you have to do things like this and proscribed is you cannot do things like this. And then you are simply told that uh, if you belong to this group in the society, means certain castes, then you can do it. If you belong to some other group of uh, certain castes, you cannot do it. Okay. Uh, there was a long time back. Uh, huge political uproar in this country, uh, when a local community in Odisha took offence of a Dalit community uh, person visiting a Hindu temple. Okay. Uh, the whole episode attracted uh, the attention of the nation 
and then the chairman of the SCST uh, commission, okay. he decided to go to that temple. Uh, now, uh, the chairman of uh, these commissions are powerful bod bodies no? and therefore, the chairman has uh, certain uh, privileges. Now, when uh, this man who enjoys certain uh, power in the system of governance decided to go to that temple, okay, the whole of the district administration there in Odisha, they had to you know, uh, ensure that uh, nothing untoward happens there on this spot. Okay. Uh, this man visits the temple to see that the temple gate was locked okay. and the dominant people who used to administer uh, the day to day affairs in the temple, they were simply absconding, which basically means that this man was not allowed once again an entry into the temple. So, you could be you know the chairman of uh, uh, national commission but fine, I do not allow you uh, to visit the temple in which my God sits, because I and you do not share the same caste. Again, I am made to realize okay, that there are some people who are more powerful compared to me, simply because I do not belong to certain caste. Okay. So, you realize that because I am not an, instruct, uh, not an instructor, therefore I do not have a say. You realize that uh, I do not belong to certain caste, therefore I do not have a say. And therefore, if you uh, know the same way, if you start you know, looking at many, many uh, social phenomena in contemporary society, do not go to the history, you would realize that in most of the cases, okay, things have been taken into account from the majority's viewpoint. Okay. And within majority, if you start drawing lines, if you put the grids there, okay, then you will realize that there are the viewpoint only of the powerful majority which has been taken into account. Okay. But this leads to another sociological debate, we are not interested in that debate. Okay. So, if the majority of people in a given society, they accept a particular way of life to be correct, then anyone who deviates from the norm okay, will be designated as abnormal. Okay. So, the majority says that this is the behavioral pattern that should be followed in the society and because before defining the norm, even if you have been practicing some other uh, form of behavior, you are put out of the circumference of this uh, you know, social framework of normality and therefore, you are uh, you know, designated as somebody who is not normal. couple of years back, there was an interesting documentary by uh, National Geography. This documentary was uh, about uh, the young generation of India, those who are uh, going to software industry okay. and that age group would be 20, 21, okay. that was the age group, where uh, this whole uh, uh, know, program was based on what happens to somebody who just graduates, okay, is uh, know, at a prime uh, stage of his life, 20, 21 years of age, okay, joins a job and gets a salary which is uh, know, extremely exorbitantly high. One interesting thing in that was that uh, what they had done was they took the boys and the girls who have gone to this profession very recently and also looked at their family background, they talked to their parents okay. and uh, know, numerically if I say that uh, the difference between the take home salary of the father or the mother or both of them put together with the child okay, was nowhere comparable. Okay. So, may be that uh, know, the monthly income of this younger generation was much more uh, know, higher compared to the annual salary of their parents put together, both the parents put together. Okay. So, that was one interesting way of looking at it, but uh, why I am quoting that example is uh, that these uh, young boys and girls, they were asked know, that say uh, uh, once you are in job, so what are the changes that you see in your lifestyle and uh, 
the changes in the behavior. I was looking at it from what changes it has led to the behavioral practices of people like this. And uh, one interesting aspect was that when they were asked, so what now? You studied, you are placed, what now? Interestingly, there were only two responses. Can you make a guess? What next? Any guess? There were only two. They said, what next? The first was getting a flat. No, car was not there. <laughs> car came little later. Okay, after flat, getting married. Okay. So, these young boys and girls, at this stage in life, when they are otherwise economically extremely affluent compared to their uh, no, uh, all those uh, who belong to uh, them. What next flat, what next marriage? When parents were asked, so what next for your child? The answer was exactly the same. Okay. Uh, I would like my child to now have a flat and I would like my child now to get married. So, there is a no, very, very uh, high uh, premium that has been put on marriage in our society. Okay. That if you uh, decide not to marry or if you delay your marriage, not only your uh, family members, okay, even the people in the community will start you know, pressurizing you that this is the peak time you should get married. Okay. I remember my bachelor hood days, okay, when I would uh, know, uh, know, receive uh, inputs like this that you should get married, okay. uh, not less than I would say 30, 35 inputs per day and it was you know, unbearable no? that why you should be uh, know, worried about me getting married or not, but this is how uh, know, the society has evolved. Okay. The beauty of marriage as a system, the beauty of marriage as an institution has been realized and therefore, people will start telling you that fine, this is the time that now you should certainly uh, know, go ahead with this. So, in terms of defining majority and in terms of defining uh, the uh, how majority's viewpoint has been taken into account, uh, in terms of defining normality, we will take marriage as an example. Okay. Because this has the highest stake in our society and what would be the second example, can you guess? We won't take that example right now, but little later we will take that example also. Having children, okay. So the society expects that after a particular age you should certainly get married, okay. And once you are married, you no know, people will start uh, you know, counseling you that you should certainly have a child, okay. And we would take these two examples because they are considered to be of utmost importance in our social framework, okay. So let's uh, first take the example of marriage. From a social viewpoint, because we are trying to define normality uh, no, as a social construction, so the social viewpoint is that uh, I am taking the Hindu viewpoint, okay, again here you can have uh, differences, uh, but because again I am taking the dominant viewpoint, therefore I am taking the uh, Hindu viewpoint, because our census report shows that majority in this country belongs to uh, this type of uh, practice. Now, Hinduism describes marriage as a sanskar. No? Out of the 16 sanskars, marriage happens to be the 13th one and therefore, it is a sacred act. This is a social viewpoint, okay, where uh, recently somebody gave a statement regarding marriage uh, that it is a contract. I do not know if you are aware of this. Just two days back, uh, one of the political leaders gave this statement and it is being hugely debated. No? Uh, in the electronic media, uh, the uh, uh, weightage that such type of statements from somebody uh, who belongs to or who represents a political party uh, should give or not. But overall, minus this political angle, you can look at uh, marriage as a sacred act, the reason being that it is uh, one of the sanskar and if you ex want to be very precise, out of the 16 sanskars uh, defined if, uh, in Hinduism, this is considered to be the 13th sanskar and therefore, marriage becomes a sacred act. 
take a legal view point. Okay. Uh, I do not know uh, law, I have never studied it, but just uh, know to quote from uh, the Marriage Act of 1955 that is being followed. Section 5 of uh, uh, that act says that this uh, act extends to all Indians except those residing in the state of Jammu and Kashmir. Okay. And this is how Hindu marriage has been defined. One, neither party has a spouse living at the time of the marriage, means neither the bride side nor the groom side okay, uh, should not have a spouse who is living. Okay. So, after the death of your spouse, if you are going for a remarriage, it is acceptable, but if your spouse is living and if you are not legally divorced, then you cannot marry. But that is one, you can see here you know, the, the important ones that we will take lead from our you know, colored red here. Two, at the time of the marriage, neither party A is incapable of giving valid consent to it in consequence of uh, in uh, unsound uh, unsoundness of mind. Okay. Means, you give a consent for your marriage, okay, but your consent will only be uh, accepted if you are found to be in a sane state, you should be in a sound state of mind. If you are mentally unsound, then fine, your acceptance does not matter. 1. 2. Though capable of giving a valid consent, has been suffering from mental disorder of such a kind or to such an extent as to be unfit for marriage and for the procreation of children. Now, remember even in the legal framework, after marriage what has to be done it also gets defined, you know that procreation a biological act also has been put together in the marriage act here. Okay. Now, interesting part here is that you should not be suffering from a mental disorder, okay, uh, which influences uh, you know, your marital life or your ability to procreate. Okay. Again you have mental disorder coming into picture here and C has been subjected to recurrent attacks of insanity, means you have to be consist consistently sane. Okay. So, basically and of course, I must tell you that uh, you know, only selected part of the marriage act has been put here, no? the full of marriage act is not displayed here. So, do not think that these are the only three things. Okay. But these three things uh, you know, are important uh, for us, uh, you know, because even in the legal framework you find unsound state of mind, you find mental disorder and you find uh, insanity being taken into account. When I was referring to the documentary on uh, you know, the young generation joining uh, the software industry, there you had what next flat marriage. Okay. I was telling uh, one of my own uh, experiences where the society and the people in the society who are very distantly or remotely connected to you, even they will tell you that no, that is, this is the age of marriage, this is the age of having children. Okay. And even in the legal framework you find that uh, no, you should be able to uh, no, perform the act of marriage, you should also be uh, in the position to procreate. So, marriage uh, know, from a social viewpoint, very sacred act, from uh, the legal viewpoint, fine you should not be having uh, an attack of insanity, you should not be suffering from mental disorder which affects your marital life or your ability to procreate and you should be in a sound state of mind to give consent for it. So, overall in most of the sections of the Indian society, okay, marriage with a single partner is prescribed and this is followed that at any given point uh, no you should not be having more than one spouse of course there are deviations no we will uh, just touch upon that issue so socially morally and legally monogamy is the norm okay you have only one uh, no spouse at one point in time this means monogamy would be the norm for somebody uh, no, uh, who, whose uh, behavior would be interpreted in terms of whether he is normal or not or whether he is you know, fitting into that uh, social expected uh, you know, construct of normality or not 
whether one would one's behavior would be considered to be morally correct or not and whether one's behavior would be considered to be legally correct or not okay now uh, before we take the example further if one has multiple spouse and has a uh, you know physical relationship with them this is how polygamy is defined and uh, you know polygamy again can be of two types polygyny and polyandry where polygyny is a man with multiple wives and polyandry would be women with multiple husbands okay now once you know what polygamy is what polygyny is and what polyandry is now let's look at these places in the country these are just some representations uh, a group in himachal pradesh there you find a fraternal polyandry where women marries the eldest son of the family and lives as wife to all the brothers okay you have uh, the johnson bauer community in uttarakhand where you find polyandry okay uh, in meghalaya and in arunachal pradesh okay uh, you find you know uh, the naishis where non fraternal polyandry is followed you have khasis where once again non fraternal polyandry is followed uh, in uh, the nilgiri plateau area you find the toda community where you find fraternal polyandry okay and in kerala you find you know a matrilineal community of the nayars in kerala where you have polyandry what i am trying to uh, you know say with this example is that we were looking at marriage okay where find uh, initially we said that it is a sacred act okay and therefore the relationship uh, between a uh, couple is very very uh, sacred in nature and it has to be preserved in that way and this is the norm of the society we took the legal uh, view point okay uh, which said that uh, fine with all this the important thing would be that uh, at one given point in time you should have only one living partner okay and then therefore socially it was important uh, no to be loyal to your uh, husband or your wife to be dedicated to your husband or your wife and to refrain from activities of physical proximity with uh, no any other individual which later on became morally uh, no uh, acceptable that if you do not practice it then this is an immoral act socially unacceptable morally wrong legally again uh, no it uh, no can lead you to punitive measures but when you look at uh, no these many uh, communities you find that uh, it prevails now this would basically mean that when you were defining marriage as a social construct when you were defining marriage uh, as a moral construct okay the view points of these uh, community were not taken into account okay now remember that this practice you would find in these communities before this act came into place this means that aberrations were not taken into account while defining uh, what is socially correct what is legally correct and what is morally correct okay now uh, with the spread of the modern lifestyle you will find that many of these customs no that uh, polyandry polygyny that we have discussed they are slowly being phased out but what is important to note is that although various practices prevailed in the society the majority view became the norm and the majority view also became the law of the land so i have been living my life in a particular way and then you tell me that sorry i have defined the law now now you should behave like this in many a things such type of situation you encounter say take for example uh, i think majority of you have undergone uh, coaching for your je exams okay and if i ask you what was your bed time during uh, those days and you say that 2 o'clock in the night i used to go to sleep 8 o'clock in the morning i used to wake up okay and then suddenly you uh, come to a situation where you are told 8 o'clock the day begins the lectures will begin you say that no although i used to you know sleep late in the night wake up early in the morning uh, but afternoons i used to take a nap 
or I used to sleep for one hour or so. And here you are told that no, afternoons we will have labs, so you are not free. Okay. Means, one place where the norms are defined for you and you are simply tried, uh, you have to try your level best to comply to it, nothing else. Okay. Are aberrations possible? In certain cases, yes, it is possible. Okay. Uh, but when you look at it from a legal perspective, you would realize that you know, the boundaries are much more uh, rigidly defined okay, compared to when you take certain forms of aberrations when it comes to social acceptance. Okay. And again you will find a difference between the social and the moral acceptability of an act. Okay. We saw the example of uh, marriage which was from a social viewpoint a sacred act, but think of uh, say procreation, think of uh, say different forms of marriages, think of uh, the act of biological procreation uh, before you follow the social or the legal framework of marriage, means you uh, become an unwed father or an unwed mother for example. Is it legally correct? You will have uh, legal experts talking about the incorrectness of the act. You will have the moral guardians of the society telling you that how morally incorrect this type of behavior is. You would have uh, no people from the society telling you that uh, fine, this is uh, no an aberration. This is usually not acceptable in the society. Okay, but look at people who have done this. Okay. And you would realize uh, that they too have been accepted in the society. Uh, we had uh, uh, known, well known uh, cine actress in our country, okay, who became unwed uh, mother okay, uh, out of a relationship with uh, one of the very well known uh, cricketers from outside. No, I would refrain taking names here. Okay. But then you realize that the whole issue gets debated, even in the media it comes into picture, uh, but then was the women socially segregated? The answer is no. This means that you have a social framework, you have a moral framework, okay, but then society will accept aberrations. No? Now, uh, no, you can also look at it from that why there was a need for a norm to be evolved. Okay. Now, uh, does this norm has to do with faithfulness and loyalty, which are components of morality then. Okay. And social framework will always look into the moral issues. So, by and large the dynamics of human adjustment process needs to be understood in totality. So, when you define normality, take behavior, take the social viewpoint, take the moral viewpoint, take the legal viewpoint, but then from a psychological viewpoint when we look at it, okay, the acceptance of a behavior becomes much higher, because even aberrated forms of behavior will also be accommodated in terms of defining who is normal and who is not.